Welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted, episode 834. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm George Conger. Today is December 15th, 2023. All right, thank you for joining us for another show of Anglican Unscripted. This is where Kevin and George sit down in our happy place and talk about the news that we find on the internet or news that we write for the internet on anglican.inc, our kind of sister website to Anglican Unscripted. George, how are you doing this week? Very good. Preparing for Christmas, uh, pageant this weekend, and the holiday celebrations the next weekend. Got a lot of, you know, we've got three nursing homes signed up for Christmas Day services in addition to the parish festivities, so this is the time of year. Yeah, this and Holy Week are your two busiest weeks by far. Uh, it draws people to church, thank God, uh, and then, but yet you have to, have to do the extra services too. Well, this is also Florida because we get a lot of visitors just over Christmas, uh, Christmas uh, and, New- and Easter uh people who show up because many of our folks are all visiting grandchildren or children across the country uh, we do live in a mobile society we do absolutely in fact uh jill's twin sister is coming down on saturday to spend a week with us and that'll be fun i assure you it'll be fun so yeah that's that's the holidays uh what you got any special plans for the holidays george <laughs> <laughs> to sleep when it's over yes. We are getting another dog, though. That's Susan's big Christmas present. We're getting another Cavalier, a female this time. So uh, she's all excited. And uh, uh, just as we got the one house trained, we're not going to start over. Of course. Now, I do need to say sorry up front to the listening audience. I have a cough. I'm recovering from a cold. I've got my first cold in like 10 years, and it's just sticking in there. And if I cough, I do have a cough button. If I don't reach that cough button, I'll have to edit out the cough. And we'll just see if we can get this all working. Uh, Before we get any further into the show, it's Christmas. And if you could give George and Kevin a good Christmas gift, it would be to like us. That little like button you see on Facebook and on on YouTube is free advertising for us. It tells YouTube and Facebook that, hey, we're worth listening to and worth promoting and worth promoting to other Anglicans and Christians around the world. So please do that. If you've not done so yet, go and read the comments. The comments for each episode are just amazing how many people go there and continue the conversation. The show doesn't end when we click the stop button. The show ends when you stop commenting. If you've not shared the show with friends or relatives or foes, we should do the foes, uh, you need to do that as well. Just, hey, hey, I found this in the internet. They're kind of funny. They do a good job. They're sometimes accused of being wrong, but they're, they're never really wrong. Right, George? So that's absolutely true. We have another example today. <laughs> All right, on to the news. Our first news story, if I had the right the news page coming up here. Uh, we don't have a lot of American stories this week. I'm sorry for our American audience, but we're going to go back to Mozambique, where we find out our report last week and the week before in Mozambique was correct, even though we were accused by higher ups of being incorrect, George. Kind of sad. Well, Mozambique is going through a bit of a, a leadership crisis. Its acting primate, uh, Carlos Mazzini, has received uh, a letter signed by eight of the province's 11 bishops uh, saying he needs to retire, he needs to retire now. And we've been reporting this developing story. Mazzini is the bishop of Maputo, which is the capital, used to be called Lorenzo Marquez, in Mozambique. and. He is a uh, he is the chairman of the National Elections Commission, uh, and they had national elections and they were fraudulent this past uh, October, where the ruling Fralimo party, uh, the the returns came back saying, "Oh gosh, you've won fifty nine of sixty uh, districts or cities," and this is uh, absolutely fraudulent. Uh, because the uh, 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 
the the opposition party held about 15 of the seats before and they were actually doing much better than in the past well you're, you're saying they didn't get the 80 million votes no uh okay. maybe they well maybe they hired joe biden's get out the vote uh uh thing. well it was fraud and several local courts found there was fraud and the and Metzine decided to abstain from uh, affirming the outcome. He didn't say yes, he didn't say no. Well, the bishop said, hey, hey, wait a second, you can't do that. The church needs to be a voice of truth and constancy, and it needs to call out injustice when it sees it. And thus began the, the, the battle over getting rid of Metzine. And this past week, the bishops put out a letter saying, look, just retire save yourself the embarrassment save the church the embarrassment of being impeached or deposed just let's get it over with you've had a good run but if you want to hold on until your term of office retires at the end of 2024 i'm sorry we eight of 11 bishops and mazzini is one of the 11 we eight of the 11 will not recognize your authority now Early on in this story, we reported that uh, Sammy Waimea, and it's not Waimea, but that's a bay in Hawaii, <laughs> Sammy Waimu, who Waimea. is the Archbishop of Canterbury's uh, advisor for Anglican Communion Affairs, and Anthony Pogo, the Anglican Consultative Council Secretary General, had been going down to Mozambique to get lobby the bishops to support Metzine. And the Anglican Consultative Council's press office put out a statement saying, this is a lie. All provinces are independent and have nothing to, we have nothing to do with their internal deliberations. And once again, Anglican Inc. is telling a lie. And Anglican Unscripted is nefarious for how wrong they always are, if I yeah. do remember the memo, yes. You know, in, in the past, we reported how the Archbishop of Kenya complained that the ACC delegates from Kenya uh, used forgery to uh, get to uh, uh, the Zambian ACC meeting, and we were called liars. Except Kevin and I had the interview on tape when Jackson, uh, when uh, Eliud Wabakula uh, told us this. Well, unfortunately for the ACC, once again, in the bishop's letter, they pointed out that the uh, Archbishop of Canterbury's people had been pressing them to regularize the appointment of Metzina, making him the primate, not the acting primate, but we voted no. So what's this again about not interfering in other provinces? We've got a letter signed by eight of the 11 of them saying that you have been interfering <clears throat> on behalf of Metzina. Well, why would they do that? Well, Metzina is a Welby boy. He follows the Archbishop of Canterbury. He's an African primate who is not part of GAFCON, not part of the Global South. He and the South African are the ones that Welby can point to and say, look, we're, uh, we're, we ha don't have any problems in Africa. Well, eight of the, the we had a lot of uh, Mozambique and Angolan bishops at the last GAFCON meeting, and Metzine is not representative of them, but Welby wants this guy to hold on in office, even though he's a corrupt politician. Welby? So... Well, yes, Metz uh, well, it, 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 it you could apply the term to either side because, you know, Welby, well, let's not put Welby. Let's just say the institution, the blob in London, mm -hmm. the, the people, the faceless bureaucrats don't really care about the integrity of the office of Archbishop of Mozambique and Angola. They care about the fact that there's another vote for the system and the status quo even if this guy is damaged goods well i think they can even be conservative uh in mozambique as long as they're non-gafcon oh yeah i mean yeah. it's not that Matsine is pro-gay or anything like no. that far from it he is just a good soldier mm -hmm. um he is uh happy to say what needs to be said at international mm -hmm. meetings to support the archbishop mm -hmm. but back in angola he says you know what the local culture uh, has to bear will bear will bear all right let's move on to a report on safeguarding in the church of england 
uh, as many of you know, uh, years ago now, there was a uh, group of people put together to investigate what went wrong with safeguarding. And uh, these people ended up getting fired because they got too close to the truth, George. Now there is an autop- autopsy, uh, autopsy report on that. Sarah Wilkinson is an independent attorney and outside lawyer barrister who was engaged by the Church of England to do an autopsy on the failure of the Independent Safeguarding Board. And essentially, what she reported in a 185 page report released on Monday that it wasn't independent, uh, it was, was not independent. It wasn't safeguarding, it was reputation protecting, and it wasn't a board because these people had no real authority. Mm -hmm. She basically pointed out that from the very beginning, this was doomed to fail because there were no clear lines of authority, no clear lines of responsibility. Uh, The Church of England did not have to respond to their queries, and the Church of England thought that they could control these people through the Archbishop's Council. And then the last thing that sort of put the knife in it was Justin Welby kept rushing, hurrying him along, hurrying him along. I want, I want you to give a statement that's everything's all clear. So Welby was interfering, to, you know, dictating what he wanted the outcomes to be. So when the members either were resigned or got fired in frustration in dealing with the Church of England, it was because this was doomed to fail from the very beginning. Uh, now I'm not accusing Justin Welby of being. Uh, so devious and clever that he set up something to divert the public's attention about the tremendous failures of safeguarding. Rather, I just think it's a question of competency. Um, And at this stage, I believe that the blob, the, the church house people, the people who sort of run the show have sacrificed Justin Welby. Yeah, to preserve their strength. Yeah, I mean they've they've sacrificed everything. Uh, mm-hmm. they, they've given up on uh, to to have LLF LLF commended by the House of Bishops to be the new practice within the Church of England is giving up on everything. Mm-hmm. Um, that that's not a win. That's taking the, the Church of England off the map of leadership within the Anglican Communion. Um, now, now let me let me just pause for a second. I'm not <clears throat> saying that the Church of England is particularly notorious in safeguarding abuses. We had a story this week from the Church of Ireland, where the Church of Ireland had to pay out a hundred thousand pounds in compensation uh, to uh, the victim of a, a of a a man when he was a young boy. He was molested by a parish priest in Belfast, and in the seventies. And in response to the allegations of abuse, the Church of Ireland moved him from the city down to uh, County Tipperary, the middle of nowhere, a nice rural Irish country parish. And the Church of Ireland and the Boy Scouts, because he was also a scoutmaster, 30, 40 years later, wind up paying 100,000 pounds in compensation and having to apologize for reshuffling people. We got a story that I'm working on for today for Anglican Inc., where a Boston uh, Marblehead, Massachusetts priest, who is also the chaplain of a boys' school, has uh, is going to has been indicted on uh, child molestation charges from the seventies again, and this guy's retired and he lives in Alabama, and the uh, both the di- you know the diocese of Massachusetts and the diocese of Down and Dromore today are acting very quickly as soon as they got a hint, you know. They're calling the cops and doing all this stuff. But, you know, that's not how things were done in the 70s and 80s. The difference is that the Church of England has been resisting taking responsibility for the failures of the past and cleaning up its act. Uh, Now, hold on, hold on a second. The Church of England, under Justin Welby's authority, was calling the police on dead bishops. Okay, I, I, you know, I, I'm not giving him any leeway in this at all. All I can think of, Kevin, is that Monty Python skit. There's a dead bishop on the landing, yeah. and degree of absurdity. Yeah. Uh, whether this is deflection, whether they, whether they truly believed it, but let's blame George Bell for things that could not have possibly taken place because it wasn't in the country or this and that when it was accused to have taken place. Let's apologize for imaginary crimes of George Bell, 
But we've got uh, uh, Steve Croft, the Bishop of Oxford. We've got Johnson Tamu. We've got uh, involved in the Devanicam, yeah. the Trevor Devin Trevor case mm -hmm. of a priest who was an abuser who uh, committed suicide before his trial began. We have Justin Welby and the whole Jonathan Smythe, uh, John Sm uh, Jonathan Fletcher and John Smythe affairs, where these guys knew, Welby knew. And it's been 10 years almost, not 10, seven or eight years since a promise to meet with the victims was made and no meeting was made. Oh. I've, I've bungled how long it's been, but it's been it, several years, okay, it's several been years. Almost a decade. Uh, they contact us every once in a while to remind us, by the way, we've been petitioning the office of the, of the uh, Archbishop of Canterbury to finally see him because he hinted he would and he never does. It's like the uh, Catch-22 uh, uh, major, major, major who's never in his office. You know, just not there. So so, so it, it's not that the church, because in the, in the school systems, we have just as high a rate of uh, abusive, of, uh, abusive school teachers, uh, scouting. Perverts are going to be attracted to some professions because of the availability of victims. And, the, and if you're a pervert, like little boys, little girls, ministry, school teaching, scouting, things like that <clears throat> are just, you know, great. But the problem with the Church of England is that they don't seek to take responsibility and seek to move forward. Instead, it's all reputation protection, reputation protection. They will admit it's wrong. They will not admit culpability, mm -hmm. and that that if you if that's your if that's, if that's your standard, you're no longer in in the realm of accountability. And the yeah. other thing that this has led to is a culture of bullying within the higher echelons of the Church of England. <clears throat> I can't tell you how many letters we've received. I'll I'll, I'll call it in dozens. Yeah, in dozens of letters each year by clergy who were bullied, by archdeacons, by bishops, by... by deans, but yeah, I mean... Where the, the degree of bullying of clergy by clergy um, in the Church of England is extraordinary. Um, I've never been bullied that I'm aware of in, you know, in the ministry. I mean, I may have had the theological and political disagreements, but nobody's ever thought to bully me because the culture here in the Episcopal Church, you know, I'll give Grantham that, the culture here is, it's non-bullying. It is now, not. Now, we can bring a week. Now, when, when, when it is bullying, it's the Catherine Jefford Shorey type where it's not really bullying, it's purely politics. Well, and yeah, you can understand what's going on. I know, but, it, you know, Bishop Spong was, you know, famous for withholding a check to a church that burnt down. I mean, there there is levels of bullying. Yeah, there, you know. yeah but the thing is that those are the exceptions yeah. where when Spong uh, being a total jackass, yeah. even the liberals will say there was a side of him we don't really want to talk about. Yeah. But yeah. that bullying, um, I hear it from people in the Church of England all the time mm -hmm. where uh, the end result is to preserve the power structure and the reputation to keep the people in top in power and to keep keep their fingers clean of, of problems. And so we've got a cult, culture of bullying and denial at the very top of the Church of England. Yeah, it's, uh, it's, I, to, and to be honest, I've been in this ministry since 2006. Mm -hmm. Nobody in the Episcopal Church has ever bullied me. I've been name called and, you know, Kevin, you're fat, that type, fine, no, no big deal. But nobody has ever really threatened me or bullied me. And, you know, to their credit, they've done stupid and things, I, but. Yeah, and I think for some of our viewers, they don't understand how we can have such good relationships with people firmly on the other side. You know, someone like Colin Coward, which every time we mention it, it probably hurts his <laughs> it's, reputation. It's, it's, it's like, I'm not your because, friend. Ah, come on. Because in our experience, <laughs> we're like the, you know, uh, Oh, the, the Bishop of Connecticut who just retired. What was his name? Um, oh, um, well, Ian, Ian, Ian Douglas. Ian Douglas. Yeah, yeah. You know, 
we can have a lovely time with them. We can have a lovely meal. I don't trust them. They don't trust <laughs> me. But there's no bullying. There's just, you know, an, a, a realization that we're on opposite planets. Whereas the Church of England's fake unity has engendered uh, this culture of lying. So that the, the Church of England lives by lies. And that's how the ISB fell apart. It was all a lie. I mean, for the majority of the Episcopal ch Church leadership, I am not even in ecumenical relationships with them. I, it's a completely different faith. With yeah, you, I mean, you and I, we are. It, it, you know, in, in a, uh, a, a Christian brotherly relationship because we, we share the same beliefs uh, on nearly everything. You know? Can't say that about people at 815. Yeah. But except you, you think it uh, tastes great. Well, I think it's less it's filling. Chilling, I yes, think that's right. the <laughs> that's the difference. <laughs> oh, the 80s. All right, let's move on to a different time. Uh, why are we taking so long on these topics, George? Because we only have three news stories, and we're going to stretch this out all the way to 60 minutes. Uh, right. Folks, I did offer Kevin half a dozen Indian corruption stories, no, but he just kicked the can. I'm not going to ruin Christmas for these people. Okay, so uh, the biggest story, obviously, this this week is the um, synod from the bishops in the Church of England have commended and put forward recommendations for living love and faith that can be conducted in churches this coming Sunday. And we're going to talk about it because it, it comes in two parts. One is uh, uh, covenanted, is that the covenanted right friendships and romantic blessings. And right away, right, I read this and I go, "We are dealing with Genesis three one all over again." You know, the the first question asked in the Bible was asked by Satan, and Satan said, "Did God really say that you must not eat of the truth?" Of, of the of the tree in in the in the garden of Eden here again did God really say that these types of relationships are non-biblical are, are not of him and it, it's the oldest question in the world George and the Church of England has not been able to answer it well the Apostle Paul answered it for <laughs> us <laughs> so uh, we, we know where to go but Leviticus um, oh. so, yeah. well this 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 past week the uh, House of Bishops had a the, the, they had a meeting and by a vote of 24 to 11 they commended uh, what are called prayers of living in faith we'll call it PLF uh, church reporting has lots of these lovely uh, ac uh, ac uh, acronyms, yeah. whatever they're called uh, <laughs> <laughs> PLF basically is in two parts. It's what was promised, uh, but it is so incomplete. Well, PLF is in two parts. As met, Kevin mentioned, covenanted friendships. You can have prayers if uh, if you are great friends with somebody and you want that friendship and relationship blessed, you can do that. Uh, think of uh, uh, Holmes and Watson or and uh, Costello. Or yeah. Ben and Jerry, uh, <laughs> Jerry uh, George and Kevin, <laughs> yeah. you could have that blessed, and uh, that's fine. And then we have uh, the other types of blessings, which were for sexual or romantic, rom same gender relationships. These can only be used for these prayers of PLF can only be used for same gender. They're not designed for male female, and the. Sexual, uh, the sexual romantic prayers, uh, well, I'll start by saying, in George's opinion, it's a total fraud. Of course it's Because they give, they give, they reference uh, Ruth and Naomi, mother-in-law and daughter-in-law, or David and Jonathan, uh, wonderful friends who probably would qualify for a covenanted friendship as examples of romantic relationships, which is absolute utter nonsense. All four of these people had children with s opposite sex partners. They're not gay, except for gay activists who are gay. And it lays out that uh, you can start this, uh, <coughs> what the parameters are. It's not marriage. Uh, it's a blessing. And it sort of parses things where we're blessing the people, not really the relationship, and all this back and forth. And... 
And it's a real, it's a problem because part of the problem of the sexual relationship side is that it presumes that these relationships will be exclusive and monogamous. And what almost all the sociological and biological studies of the past generations, and this goes back to when I was in college in the 80s, um, you know, taking courses on human sexuality, is that monogamy means something different in a homosexual relationship than it does in a heterosexual relationship. Yeah, now, just now, a, now, however, there is the exception. Of course, there are exceptions. Yeah, absolutely. But, yeah, yeah. you know, like here's a German study by Martin Daniker. Only f of 4.5% uh, of homosexual men self-reported as being faithful to their partner, as opposed to 75% of uh, male, men and 85% of women in uh, relation marriages. Mm -hmm. um, promiscuity... Uh, has is defined in many parts of the literature as being definitional to male homosexuality in other words that you can be a couple you can be a faithful couple living together sharing together being together but that does not mean exclusivity in your sexual relationships there are of course exceptions the four and a half percent that the Danica report uh talks about but the church has got this fable in its mind that a male-male partnership that is being blessed, that is a sexual romantic partnership, is identical except for swapping the gender of one of the partners mm -hmm. to a male-female relationship. <clears throat> and so we start from that premise and that lie and then go forward from there. Statistically, they are not the same. Not what? Uh, of one of the many reasons uh, uh, that make them different. Just statistically, they're different. Uh, the highest mm -hmm. divorce rate now recorded in North America is between lesbians. Yeah. yeah it, and, well, well, that doesn't make sense. The two loving, emotional people? Come on. Yeah, boy. You know, so statistically, so we, it's, it, just statistically, it's different. So, okay, well, they've done it anyway. Yeah. They've put out this report. And then mm. immediately we had some responses. Port's 44 pages long. You can, I think we have a link. No, I tried putting it up on Anglican Inc. and it's too big. It's too big. Uh, <laughs> so I'm going to have to use, uh, uh, what do they call it? Uh, well, I'll find a way to get it up right. there. Uh, but so then we have the responses. Well, the, uh, the liberals say, great, wonderful. Start blessing on Sunday. The, rep the report says you can only bless in a public service. You can't do it in a standalone. You can only do it in a standalone public service, which is great because there's no definition of what a standalone public service is. I mean, we're making up terms here as we go along. Leave it to the bishops to make up terms. Yes. <laughs> and so you can't just have a public blessing with nothing else. You have to throw in communion or morning prayer or whatever you want to do with that. You can start this Sunday. And so the liberals are saying, yes, let's start this Sunday. And now we've got people like there was an article in The Spectator in the UK about a woman priest who said, well, I've been doing this anyway, and now I'm so glad it's now lawful and legal. Now, do you think she's going to be punished for having jumped the gun? Of course not. Martin Shaw, former bishop of Massachusetts in the US, he would be marrying gay couples before the Episcopal Church announced it. And he said it was a matter of justice and prophetic ministry. And of course... They're not going to touch him. Yeah, and became pathetic ministry. I yeah. yeah. Okay, well, then we have the conservative responses, and they're sort of across the board. Uh, the Paul Williams is the Bishop of Southwell in Nottingham. He's a conservative, and he has said to his clergy, <clears throat> don't use these. Uh, we don't know their legality. We don't have their canonical authority. They're not canonically authorized. And it's just a mess. Don't do it yet until we get some, this comes to conclusion, until they're approved by General Synod. Because a commendation by bishops means nothing. A commendation is on the level of, I commend Coke versus Pepsi. Uh, well, that's it has, important. Okay. You know, but, uh, <laughs> it, it, you know, it's what I like. Yeah. Well, like has no commendation, has no basis in canonical law. It's like a standalone service. These are phrases they're making up. 
as an aside, show you how screwy the Bishop of London put out a letter, Sarah Mullally, saying to her clergy, if you don't want to do this and you want alternative pastoral oversight, and I'll read the line to you, send us send me a letter and that sets out the theological and ecclesiological reasons why you cannot support the position endorsed by General Synod. That's a no-brainer. That's easy. Well, it's actually it's actually hypocritical because the <laughs> bishops have refused to put out a theological and ecclesiological position against it. So maybe she's looking for ideas yeah, maybe. Uh, for herself. Yeah, so, geez. so the liberals, after saying, "Oh, we're not," you know, badges. We don't need no stinking badges. Now they're requiring from conservatives in London at least badges. Well, the next person is Rob Monroe, the conservative uh, flying evangelical bishop, and Rob Monroe gave the three nos letter. No blessings, have your parish councils say no as well, but no to leaving the Church of England. Let's stay and fight and go down with the ship and just fight to the very end. Then we had Martin Warner, the Anglo-Catholic Bishop of Chichester, member of the Society. Martin Warner gave a letter to his clergy saying why he voted against gay blessings, a PLF, and he said this was a question of unity. It will destroy and divide the church. But Warner offered no counsel to what his clergy should do. <clears throat> so Warner is sort of on the fence saying, I personally am opposed. He's like these Democratic politicians saying, I'm personally opposed to abortion, but I'm not going to stand in the way of people who want to promote it. Okay. Well, today the society put out a letter. And the society's new president is Jonathan Baker, the Bishop of Fulham. And he's a bit of a damaged goods because in these past studies, he always came down on the liberal side and he's divorced and remarried and he should be, and he's the flying bishop in London for clergy who deplores, who opposed divorce and remarriage. Figure that one out. Uh, the society joined by Fordham faith, uh, Paul Thomas put out a letter saying, we're opposed to this. Don't do it. Uh, and then we've got, you know, the Church of England Evangelical Council saying this is a wrong, bad thing. Uh, Crosslinks put out a statement. The Church Pastoral Aid Society put out a statement. <clears throat> Andy Lyons from the Anglican Network in Europe uh, put out a statement, all opposed to it. And on Monday, before the bishops' meeting, a group called the Anglican Alliance. And that's basically an ad hoc group of people representing Anglo-Catholics, Evangelicals, Charismatics, Holy Trinity, Brompton, Nikki Gumbel's one of the signatures, urging the bishops to hold off, wait for the legal, wait for the canonical, wait for the theological, wait for the ecclesiological rationales uh, before you go ahead and do this. And the bishops then went ahead and did it, 24 to 11. So this is where we are. Uh, we're in a place where, uh, conservatives, oh, th there was a little passage, uh, in the, uh, document, the 44 page document saying, if you say no, you might get sued and be taken to court for violating the Equalities Act for discriminating against gay people. Well, that's okay. But don't worry. Uh, here's a legal argument against it. <laughs> yeah. But would not the Church of England protect their priest if they were sued? Nope. No. No. No, they didn't offer to protect them. No, they're just saying, well, here's a legal theory your lawyers might like to use. So they're admitting in their pastoral guidance that some of them are going to get sued. Now, we know how this game's play, Kevin, don't we? Yes, what sir. happens to uh, <clears throat> wedding photographers <clears throat> and gay and cake bakers in the United States who, are, who won't do gay weddings or uh, receptions? You will after half a, half a million after $25 million have been spent on your defense attorneys, make it to the Supreme Court, you will prevail before the Supreme Court, even a liberal Supreme Court, and go back to your cake shop and be sued three weeks later. Mm -hmm. That's what happens and that, in America. And we have activists who seek out uh, oh, yeah. these people, conservatives. And so what will happen is that you will have activists in England seek out parishes which mm -hmm. do not permit gay weddings, They'll go there two or three Sundays in a row, and then they'll tell the vicar that they want to get married. He'll say no, and they'll sue under the Equalities Act, and the, they'll win by lawfare. They'll bankrupt the priest. Mm -hmm. And I just, uh, 
you know, the Church of England's bishops have made this decision to go ahead and bankrupt the clergy who will stand fast against it. So it's a, t it's a, it's it. First, it's based on a lie that uh, exclusivity and uh, mon and monogamy mean the same thing in a male male relationship or a same sex relationship as they do in an opposite sex relationship. It's a lie where the Bishop of London is saying, well, defend yourself theologically and ecclesiologically against this when they refuse the liberals to give the same reasons for it. Mm -hmm. It's a lie because the conservative clergy are being hung out to dry uh, and uh, be the victims of lawfare. Um, it's an abandonment of leadership, of faithfulness. And, but at the same time, we have some people standing up for what is right and true. Paul Williams, Rob Monroe, even Martin Warner, the society, mm -hmm. Forward in Faith. They're making all the right noises. But will it really matter once you get served and uh, you see that your life's savings and life's works are going to go out the window yeah. Yeah. because you have to hire an attorney <clears throat> to defend yourself? <sighs> oh, Christmas is coming up in other news. I mean, it, it is depressing to watch this happen to a church, uh, formerly the Mother Church of the Anglican Communion. You know? Well, Kevin, we do have one American story that just hit me. Okay. That, uh, Jeff Walton passed to us. Oh, what's that? The Matthew Shepherd. Oh, uh, yes. The uh, At the Washington National Cathedral, they've created a little saint out of Matthew Shepard, who was a young man who was murdered in Wyoming about 10, 15 years ago. And he's been turned into a gay icon, where it's claimed that he was murdered because he was a gay man in homophobic Wyoming. And Gene Robinson was the celebrant, and the, the preacher, I'm sorry. And they had uh, one of these people from the Sisters of Perpetual Indulgence, which is this mock group of transvestites who dress up as nuns and mock Catholic liturgy and doctrine and dogma. Yeah. These are the people the Dodgers had one son, one one day and uh, uh, reasons why the Dodgers died in the <laughs> pennant race. Right. They didn't make it to the World Series. You know, no. Yeah. <laughs> well, they had the abbess of this group speak from the pulpit at the Washington National Cathedral now, here's another example of a lie. All the stuff that's come out since then shows that Matthew Shepard, yes, he was a gay man, but he was murdered by another gay man over a drug deal. Drug deals, yeah. I mean, the truth of what happened to Matthew Shepard has been out there for a dozen years. Uh, witnesses and stuff like that. But they, they wrote a, uh, a play called The, the Man from uh, Lebermere, where, wherever he was. Laramie. Uh, Laramie, sorry. La okay, I really know the play well. Uh, Laramie, where they went and made the whole town a homophobic town in, in this play. And the vast reality here is the, the truth of what happened to him. Uh, he, he is a person who died in a drug deal who happened to be gay. And one of his partners, mm -hmm. let's talk about exclusivity and monogamy, one of his gay partners was one of his murderers. <sighs> and <clears throat> now, are we saying, are we defending the murder of Matthew Shepard? Absolutely not. Nope. What we're saying is that uh, we cannot live by lies in the Christian world, and so much of what the modern church is pushing out there are lies. Can, and, can, you know, can, listen to what you just said. The church is pushing lies. I just, it, it's unfathomable to me as a, a young Christian. Now, you know, I guess I've only been a Christian since 1982. You know, this is crazy. Okay, the institution is pushing lies. Yeah, I, uh, the, the, yeah. I know, crazy. All right, let me check my story sheet. That's it? That's Nothing. It. Nada. Oh. Oh, hold on. I, I'm going to add to that. What to get Kevin and George for Christmas? I guess we want two plane tickets to go up to uh, uh, check out the uh, ACNA provincial meeting that's going to be held in Pennsylvania. Uh, how much money did you figure we have to raise? Oh, Latrobe, PA. It, well, the 
Housing is two twenty five a person. That okay. includes meals. Okay, that's about five. And then tickets from uh, Tampa to Pittsburgh are about two hundred a pop. Mm -hmm. And then we got to rent a car because Latrobe is out there. Yeah, way in the out woods. There. <laughs> so we're figuring, you know, uh, let's start a thousand bucks. A thousand bucks. So uh, please go to the link in the show notes. It will take you to our uh, uh, PayPal account and donate uh, for Anglican TV, Anglican Scripted, and Anglican.inc to attend the ACNA uh, provincial meeting, where I assume they're going to be electing another. Um, Yes, Foley Beach uh, finished shops. They're going to. A, we went to the last one in Latrobe where they elected Foley Beach, mm -hmm. and uh, we waited until the white smoke came out of the uh, St. <laughs> Vincent's Chapel. I was there. I was there. Uh, Foley Beach came out of the conclave because and he came up to me. He didn't go up to Andrew Gross. Didn't talk to anybody else. Says, Kevin, they just elected me the Archbishop. You can't tell anybody till two. <laughs> like, no. <laughs> so yeah. Uh, it'll be fine. We'll find out who the next one is. And, uh, we'll hopefully arrange for a nice exit interview for Foley Beach. He certainly did a great... He did a tremendous job, and uh, uh, I'm sure he'll be happy he's not traveling so much anymore. That's 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 a job, George. All right, that brings us to the end of another Unscripted. I'm Kevin Coulson. And I'm George Conger, and you've been watching episode 834 of Anglican Unscripted.